Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we're going to get into the second part of the Otto von Bismarck series, A Man of Great Ideas by Extra History. Let's get into it. 1848, the People's Spring, springtime of nations, the year of revolution. Bismarck's political life ended nearly as abruptly as it started. For as the summer of 1847 began, the king, unable to get a railroad grant from the Diet without also granting a constitution, threw his hands up in the air, dissolved the Diet, and sent everybody packing. Bismarck went back home to his estate, finally completed that whole business of getting married, and went on his honeymoon. But as he traveled Europe, and when he returned home, he noticed a strange tension in the air, an unrest in the streets, in the cities. Then, in February 1848, Paris erupted. The monarchy fell. A republic was re-established in France. Bismarck was concerned. At home and abroad, he had seen the strain between the working class and those who ruled, but he never expected something so abrupt or so successful to happen in France. Then Vienna fell. Metternich, the great Austrian statesman and architect of the Concert of Europe, was displaced. This opened up an opportunity, as the Austrians had long been the dominant force among German states. But it Okay, so yeah, this is a major push throughout the populace of Europe and really across the world at this time. This idea that there doesn't need to be monarchies. The, the rule of countries needs to be left to the people that inhabit the country, that they should have self-determination and should be able to curb the power of the ruling class, if not outright demolish the ruling class. So you see a lot of push and pull here where you have uh, some ideas that resemble the ideology and thought process of something like socialism, where in some areas that's the direction they go in. You have other places where they say, okay, well, we're just going to scrap everything and start a democracy. So there is this kind of push and pull between where exactly the line is, but there's definitely a, a more liberal pull in the, in the, you know, actual definition of liberalism, there's a more liberal pull on the populace of the world at this time. It also served as a warning. It was clear that revolution was coming to Prussia soon. But Bismarck worried that the king was too weak and too vacillating to put down a revolution. He and was. he was right. Yep. As word of the revolution in Vienna spread, Prussians took to the streets, and soon the king promised them a constitutional government. But as the people were celebrating their victory in Berlin, the celebration turned into a clash. Shots were fired. Government troops killed revolutionaries. Many, including Bismarck, believed that now there was no choice but to crush the revolution. Okay, so this is kind of a turning point here, right? You either have to go all in or you have to completely pull back and make sure that nothing like that happens again. If you go all in, there is going to be state-sponsored violence, right? You are going to, with, with brute force, put down this revolution. If you pull all the way back, then you, you basically are not going to have a situation where you allow you know, state forces to, to be in a position where they could physically harm people that are, are out protesting or or whatever they're doing on the side of the revolution the people that are pro-conservative that believe in the monarchy like bismarck he's he says okay well you've already jumped the shark here you've already fired on protesters so let's go all in let's just put down this revolution and that'll be it but because of of who wilhelm is that's he's going to make a different decision the king, though, disagreed and ordered the troops out of Berlin, effectively leaving himself hostage to the revolution. And then came the first of Bismarck's good-ish ideas. He raced back to his estate and organized an old-school peasant levy. Yes, in the middle of the 19th century, he tried to press his peasants into service as their feudal lord in order... I'm not sure this is 
a goodish idea, but it's it's a funny idea. To put down a revolution whose stated goals were to enfranchise and empower those same peasants. Yep. With this great idea in mind, he handed them all shotguns and said, Come on, lads, to Berlin! But just as they were storming off, one of his spoil sport neighbors came out and told him to stop hurling a firebrand into the country, threatening to talk the peasants out of this nonsense. Bismarck politely replied, You know that I am a quiet man, but if you do that, I shall shoot you. So with revolver in hand and four, yes, four bullets in his pocket, he led his feudal levy to go liberate the king. Unfortunately, when he got to the first army camp, which was staffed by many of the conservative officers that he had come to mingle with after making his fiery speeches in Berlin, he was promptly told, Yes, we are all a bit disappointed right now, but no, we really don't want your peasant mob messing this up even more, so how about you go send your peasants back and bring us some corn and potatoes or something? Not content to serve as mere fodder provider for the army, Otto then had his second good-ish idea. He left his estate and tried to sneak into Berlin again, with the cleverest of ruses, trimming his beard. Needless to say, many people saw through his incredible mind games, and soon he was laughed out of Berlin. But Bismarck was not done. He had a third good-ish idea. With the king making ever greater concessions to the revolutionaries, Bismarck saw it as his place to help elevate one of the king's relatives to the throne. So Bismarck went all in Ooh. on trying to replace King Frederick Wilhelm with a baby. confusingly but more succinctly named King Wilhelm. He's gonna go find a baby. Oh, uh, this was such a not good idea. Um, again, these are all not what I would call goodish ideas. Funny, maybe. Uh, unlikely to work. Not, not, he, he does not have many good-ish ideas. He has one really good idea, but, but th these are not them. Um, also, I'm not sure what Wilhelm, I'm not sure what his thought process here is here, because he doesn't want to put down the revolution, but he doesn't want to lose his crown. But when he sends the army away, he just has revolutionaries. Again, it said, like, he's basically a hostage and he's making more and more concessions to the revolutionaries because he doesn't have a choice. He's a hostage. And so I'm not sure exactly what his thought process is here other than maybe that he doesn't want to shoot or put down revolutionaries. I'm not really sure. Um, but again, Bismarck being pro-monarch is, is not for this. But Wilhelm had legged it to England, and he wasn't going to listen to this wild man anyway. So Bismarck began to hunt for a new candidate. Soon he found another royal relative named Charles, who proposed that his even more confusingly named son, Frederick Wilhelm, should replace Frederick Wilhelm on the throne. This Frederick Wilhelm, or Fritz, I'm going to call him Fritz, was six years old. But nobody had asked Fritz's mom. I mean, they eventually... Yeah, okay, so not, not a baby. I guess I guess I over-exaggerated a little bit, but I remembered he was super young. Did, but more as an afterthought, with Bismarck awkwardly meeting her in her servants' quarters. Not asking turned out to be a mistake, though, because Fritz's mom supported the liberals and put the kibosh on the whole thing. It would seem that Bismarck had made an enemy of the mother of this six-year-old he hoped to put on the throne. Nonetheless, he was soon summoned for the second Prussian Diet, which the king had ordered a symbol to hammer out how to make a real parliament for Prussia. There, Bismarck spoke passionately about the noble past that they were so casually throwing away, even becoming choked with emotion and having to stop mid-speech, but to no avail. The Diet did its job and created the Prussian National Assembly, which Bismarck was very not elected to. This Prussian National Assembly pushed for a real parliamentary system along British lines, though, and soon the king began to lose patience with the body. So Bismarck joined the Camarilla, which was not, in fact, a secret society of vampires which has kept their presence hidden from humanity for hundreds of years, though I can understand your confusion, and let's be honest, Bismarck would have made a great vampire, but no. Bismarck joined the much more boring but real group of nobles and courtiers close to the king who were determined to maintain the power of the monarchy through non-vampiric means. And let's go ahead and call this one Bismarck's first actual good idea, because this put him in contact with many powerful men. 
But even though, by all accounts, he was an effective member of the society, and even though he had amplified the conservative voice in Prussian politics by establishing a newspaper, when the liberal cause fell apart and the conservatives once again became ascendant, he was passed over for a cabinet position. They were very happy to use him when a radical was needed, but once the time came to re-establish order, the wild man was cast aside. So Bismarck returned to his estate to witness the birth of his first child. But Bismarck had a plan. Bismarck always had a plan. You see, even though the liberals had failed to get anything like the constitution they had wanted, they had gotten a constitution, and with it, a parliament, the Landtag. And Bismarck, always a pragmatist under whatever colors he may have worn, decided to get himself elected to this new body. The this was the thing that I was thinking was the good idea, was once the, the parliament was established that he got, actually got voted into the body. The fight was fierce. He knew that he wouldn't get elected in his own region, so he decided to run for office in the city of Brandenburg. But there he was an outsider, running against the local mayor. He acted with vigor, describing his campaign headquarters as a military camp, with messengers running in and out at all hours, and strategy being formulated so that he never missed an opportunity to speak to the few hundred men who would eventually determine the representative for Brandenburg. He won by 25 votes. Now he was once again at the center of things, and the question at hand on everybody's mind was the unification of Germany. If the 39 German states that had survived the Napoleonic invasion banded together, they could change the face of European politics forever. But how to achieve that was a matter of some debate. They could either come together under Austria or under Prussia. But Austria rejected the possibility of unification, because the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Habsburg-inherited lands included far more territory than just the German portions. And the whole point of unification was German nationalism. Germans would never accept rule by a sovereign who was also ruling over other nations. This meant that the Austrians would either have to divide their empire and give some other branch of the family their German territories, or simply reject unification outright. And they chose the latter. This is a massive mistake by the Austrians, in my opinion. I think that they should have gone with cutting the empire and allowing, um, allowing for at least the option of a formation of German unification under Austria. I think it would serve them far, far better in the long term to have that be the case. And just think about what a unified Germany is like that's a massive amount of territory and people and and it's just you know it has everything it'll be one huge economy it'll basically be um, you know a a singular European massive force the the second that it is declared as unified the German National Assembly, which was different from the Landtag in that it represented all German states, decided, with little other choice, to offer the imperial crown to Frederick Wilhelm. Nobles in the Landtag, including Bismarck, urged him to accept. But the king rejected the proposal, and this allowed Bismarck the opportunity to rail against the constitution that would have come with it. He was blasted by the press, and sure of losing his seat in the next election. But when the king dissolved the Landtag, he changed the election rules for the next session in ways that favored landowners like Bismarck, which ensured his re-election. After giving some blistering speeches on the role of the monarchy, and some strong invectives against even the monarch's own move toward a constitutional unification, Bismarck got himself moved to the new assembly debating the question of unification. But before that could go anywhere, he got caught up in the next great conflict. The war over territory seemed to loom between Austria and Prussia, and it is here that we see the evolution of Bismarck. Because though in many ways he was, and always would be, a man of war, when a settlement was offered, and many pushed to reject it and go to war instead, Bismarck rose and said, It is unworthy of a great state to fight for something which does not concern its own interest. Gentlemen, show me an objective worthy of war, and I will go along with you. It is easy enough for a statesman to ride the popular wave from the comfort of his own fireside, making thunderous speeches from the rostrum, letting the public sound the trumpets of war, and leaving it to the musketeer, bleeding out his life's blood in the snowy wastes to settle whether policies end in glory or in failure. Nothing is simpler. 
But woe to any statesman who, at such a time, fails to find a cause of war which will stand up to scrutiny once the fighting is over. And so begins the transformation of Bismarck the Radical to Bismarck, man of royal politique. Yeah, Bismarck has some just awesome quotes. You can go look up a bunch of them online. They, he's got a lot more that are like that. They're just so good. And also, you do see with the, the unification and the, the push and pull between Austria and Prussia coming into the, the forefront of you know, politics and, and kind of the, it, it kind of swoops in with the push and pull of the liberal versus conservative ideas. It kind of all gets washed in together. And you really see Bismarck kind of shine in the direction of the German unification in the Austro-Hungarian and, or the Austrian Empire and the, the Prussian power grab or, or power fight that they're having back and forth, you really see Bismarck, you know, start to make a name for himself and shine in that realm. So that was part two of Otto von Bismarck by Extra History. Like, comment, subscribe, help me keep building the channel over here, and I will see you guys next time.